my hat's off to one of my colleagues, Ken Crandall, who actually um, designed most of this, this talk uh, that he had actually given for part of our lecture series at the University of Maryland for the medical school. Uh, I usually give the TBI side, and he gives the, the spine side. So that's why I have kind of both of us there. Um, and we're both in neurosurgery orthopedics uh, program of trauma, uh, at shock trauma. I have no disclosures uh, for this talk. And in, in hopefully the, the objectives that we uh, plan to cover uh, tonight is explain the epidemiology of spinal cord injury. We'll see that that's really changing. Um, some good, some bad news. Uh, describe the presentation of upper motor neuron versus lower lower motor, yeah, easy for me to say, lower motor neuron lesions, um, and describe the different spinal cord syndromes, um, and also to understand the common types of spine fractures. So here's just a distribution of um, the 10 leading causes of death, at least in 2018, that we have fairly recent statistics, heart disease, malignant neoplasm, still lead to PAC. Um, but accidents, unintentional injuries uh, are, are right up there with chronic lower respiratory diseases. Um, and I'll tell you, um, the uh, demographics for these are, are rapidly uh, changing as well. Um, falls for the elderly uh, lead to increased TBI and increased spinal cord injuries as the sort of aging baby boomers are really starting to, to uh, increase those numbers. And actually trauma itself is the leading cause of death for those less than 44 years old worldwide. And TBI is a, is a big part of that as well. And here's um, just some of uh, the statistics on spinal cord injury, the prevalence, that is how many people are living with spinal cord injury in the United States. It's about 300,000, give or take. Um, and there's statistics quoted anywhere from 11 to 12,000 folks a year. Um, have a new spinal cord injury in the U.S. And worldwide, um, it's somewhere between a quarter uh, and a half million uh, people uh, as well uh, have spinal cord injuries. And the pie graph uh, gives a breakdown of uh, some of the later statistics on motor vehicle accidents, about 38% falls, 30%. But this is changing. Um, and as I said, these statistics are going to change over the next few years. This is a paper that we had out last year uh, from, from Shock Trauma that shows our own internal data, at least in the state of Maryland, uh, over the last two decades. Uh, we can see the line um, in the incidence of causes for spinal cord injury falls or increasing. In fact, they've outpaced motor vehicle collisions and crashes, uh, certainly in 2018, and that trend's continued. Uh, up uh, until the current time. And as you would suspect, falls generate more incomplete injuries versus complete injuries, and they fortunately have fallen. And this has big implications for clinical trials that are looking at really bad spinal cord injuries. So safety mechanisms, uh, motor vehicle crashes have become more safe, uh, speed limits, seat belt regulations, better designed vehicles have all been good news for patients, but bad news from a research perspective. Um, and we're seeing more incomplete injuries. So that, that's actually good stuff. And just a couple of more figures, really, uh, of course, this stuff you don't have to remember other than just kind of a general trend of more mild injuries generated by fall. That is the mechanically stable injuries have increased and the fracture dislocations have decreased uh, commensurately. And their uh, motor score, um, that we score them by in their, their four limbs, the Asia motor score has actually steadily increased. Um, and so that's all indicative of partial injuries. So that's, that's all good stuff, um, but important to know um, as far as treating these patients coming up in the next few decades. The average age has increased over the decades, 28.7. The, the young um, motor vehicle driver, uh, for example, uh, or even passenger for that matter, uh, high speed, high energy collisions with more complete injuries. But since then, the average age has crept up uh, 40.2. So an older demographic, uh, older spine injury patients, um, and by gender, 80% uh, male. Um, and types of spinal cord injury, it's really kind of spread. And as I point out, the incomplete injuries as a total, uh, whether it's quad or, or para, uh, are increasing and increasing as, as time goes by. So good stuff.
So causes of spinal uh, cord injury trauma in, in acute sense, it's shown in the MRI there, that, that's a bad, bad looking picture there. Fractures, stenosis, acute disc herniation, all of those kind of contribute to that. Tumors can be acute or subacute. Um, natural degeneration um, could be subacute or, or chronic. A stroke uh, in the spinal cord itself, hemorrhage, demyelination for various autoimmune disorders, for example, inflammatory transverse myelitis. So all of these can enter your differential diagnosis depending on what you know about the patient. So how can they present motor dysfunction with uh, a defined weakness? Uh, can be very specific or can be diffuse, um, could present at a certain level. Myelopathy, which indicates a spinal cord injury, and we'll talk about that, that carries its own um, sort of diagnosis and can be very insidious. Sometimes folks who have a very slow, gradual spinal cord injury through degenerative changes, for example, of the disc and the ligament rubbing on the spinal cord can have very subtle findings of uh, maybe they've fallen and they're starting to fall a little bit more, or they're having difficulty using their fingers for fine motor control um, or urinary incontinence. Um, it's usually uh, overflow incontinence, uh, those, those kinds of things. And they can, tend to get written off as, oh, they're old, or they forget that they've fallen until they really fall and they have a real decline in their spinal cord function. It can present as sensory dysfunction, uh, light touch proprioception, pain and temperature, uh, autoimmune dysfunction, or autonomic, sorry, dysfunction, and sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, pathways, and we'll look at that. And so pure motor dysfunction is, is a weakness. Um, remember that paresis is a partial, um, and a plegia or paralysis is a complete. And so those are very specific terms that someone's called, um, they have a paresis or a plegia. They're talking about two very different uh, processes. And so upper motor neuron, injury to the CNS, the brain spinal cord, right? And the lower motor neuron, injury to the peripheral uh, nervous system, the roots and the peripheral nerves. So injury uh, to an upper motor neuron uh, presents as a weakness, no atrophy, except if they haven't been using it for a little bit, no fasciculation, so the little um, uh, fasciculations that you can see in, in the muscle groups, hyperreflexia, increased tone, spasticity and a babinci, okay? And in spinal cord injury, hyperreflexia and spasticity is delayed due to the spinal shock. That is, they have an areflexia when uh, you first see them. Um, normal reflex recover over sort of 24 hours um, and shortly thereafter. And then early hyperreflexia and spast outright spasticity can develop uh, later on. For the lower motor neuron, injury to the peripheral nervous system, weakness, okay. Uh, atrophy, this is where we do see atrophy, we do see fasciculations, and we see decreased reflexes and, and tone. And this is just a, a chart comparing uh, lower versus upper. And um, the, in the comments is kind of a neat little mnemonic, lower motor neuron Everything is lowered, less muscle mass, less muscle tone, less reflexes, down going toes. In upper motor neuron, everything is up, tone, uh, deep tendon reflexes, the toes, um, and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so injury to the spinal cord results in upper motor neuron symptoms, injury to the nerve roots and akata equina and lower motor neuron symptoms. And recall that the spinal cord ends from around T12 to, to L2. Um, and terms that are often used in, in this field, as I mentioned, myelopathy, uh, formal definition is a subacute dysfunction of the spinal cord, and these lead to upper motor neuron symptoms, everything up, right? And radiculopathy, where that little nerve root's getting crunched coming out of the foramen, for example, uh, it's acute subacute or chronic uh, dysfunction, um, and it's very specific. And for better or for worse, unfortunately, these get noticed very quickly, right? Somebody's got a sharp pain running down their arm or to their fingers or to the thumb, that gets your attention. But in, in the neurosurgical world, it tends to be a less severe injury, right? Than if the cord itself is getting injured, which can be very insidious in, in onset. Um, and for myelopathy, again, this, this constellation of weakness, and it's more than one muscle, um, that is the cords getting injured. So it tends not to be just say, 
you know, your thumb is weak or your wrist extension is, is weak. Um, there's numbness, again, more than one dermatome just due to the nature of the cord itself. Um, and hyperreflexia, dysfunction of, of fine hand movements. Folks tend to have difficulty buttoning buttons or doing zippers, um, drop papers or drop the coffee cup. Gait instability that tends to be a course where it's a constant stepwise decline in function where they'll kind of be okay, they'll fall or trip, they'll get worse, but they never quite come back to where they were. And then it's just this gradual decline. The course and rapidity of that, that decline is hard to predict. No one really knows. Um, and every patient's different and their compression is different. And for radiculopathy, pain, usually the main symptom, as I mentioned, that gets folks tension right away. Weakness in a particular motor group, oh, my, I can't pull my arm up or, you know, um, can't squeeze my, my hand very well. Um, numbness in a particular dermatome and hyporeflexia, decreased uh, reflexes there. And Cotta syndrome, this is always taught classically as a nurse, one of the few neurosurgical emergencies. And it sure is. Um, this uh, studies have shown that if you really don't get to this within 24 and certainly by 48 hours, um, things can, can kind of stay the way they are. Um, and so uh, usually it's from an acute disc herniation, for example, that comes across as a broad disc and, and catches a lot of these nerve roots in the cauda equina, um, and it results in weakness, numbness, a saddle anesthesia is kind of the classic um, board answer kind of thing, loss of bowel or bladder control and hyporeflexia. And often you get a call from the emergency department, folks will have one or the other um, of these and they'll say right away it's caught equina. Not necessarily. Um, but of course you you it's always good to have a good clinical exam. That's the best thing always um, in imaging. Nowadays it's it's much easier to get an MRI or CT uh, than, than it was back in back in the day, right? And so Brown Sicard, uh, again going through some of these these syndromes where um, you have uh, different types of pathology, depending on sort of a unilateral uh, lesion to the cord. Um, say if that lesion's on, on the right, there's loss of touch and uh, vibration uh, and proprioception uh, below that lesion. Uh, and then on the left, there's loss of pain and temperature, depending on where the fibers are going and where they, they cross over. Very rare. I've only seen a few of these um, in, uh, in years of, of practice. Um, and, and so uh, this is just an image of a patient who was actually stabbed um, in the neck. And it came in through this side to present it with a brown saccard. Um, and so can happen. It's more of a curiosity and really knowing and testing uh, your knowledge of pathways than anything. Central cord syndrome. Um, and soon we'll be over this laundry list of, of central, uh, syndromes as well. But central cord is, it's been studied ad nauseum in, in the field of neurosurgery. Um, it, it's something that's fascinating um, both on its uh, um, the diagnosis and the treatment and when to operate and when's appropriate for, for these patients. Um, it's an, defined as an incomplete injury. The, the upper extremities are more affected than the legs classically. Although say if someone falls and trips over a curb, they can be completely uh, quadriplegic initially, and then they'll recover some function in their legs. And then the, the hands are often last. Um, tend to have a more favorable recovery, of course, than like a classic fracture dislocation, um, because it's often a chronic thing that's irritated by uh, another jolt. And um, essentially by definition, it's without fracture or dislocation. And so it's an acute bending or hyperextension or flexion of the neck in the context that the spinal cord's already been, been uh, compressed at that point. And it gets its name by the, the fact that ischemia to the central part of the cord is classically thought to catch the fibers that are organized somatotopically um, from cervical, thoracic, and lumbar from the center out. And so the, the hands and the upper extremities tended to be hit uh, earlier. That doesn't quite hold. This is the, the classic textbook answer. 
Turns out that our upper cervical spinal cord has a ton of fibers devoted to these two things. Um, and it's really one of the things that makes human beings special. Um, and so when you have any injury in the cervical cord, you're gonna statistically knock out more of these fibers um, that are, aren't necessarily nicely and neatly rearranged in these little somatotopic areas. They're actually a little more diffuse than that. And so that's the current thinking is that statistically, you're just knocking out more of these fibers than you are uh, the legs. Um, so kind of a, a unique, more modern take on that. Anterior cord syndrome um, knocks out the, um, the, the, the motor, complete motor paralysis. Uh, all shown in, in red here, uh, the anterior horns, the loss of pain and temperature, preserved position and vibration that are in the back, um, associated with a flexion injury, um, which makes sense, um, and has a, a pretty uh, poor prognosis, just given um, the fact of where it is in the injury to, to create that. So as far as different types of, of fractures, um, that we deal with. Um, even the cervical spine has very peculiar uh, types of fractures that can happen um, and different ways of, of dealing with them. Um, occiput to C2, the cranial cervical dissociation, where literally you can have an internal decapitation. Um, C1, Jefferson uh, type fracture, it's a fracture of the ring itself. C2, odontoid fracture. These can be fractured in various ways. That's that little tooth that sticks up, right? It can be fractured off a type two where it kind of fractures just at the dens is the most common. And the Heyman fracture, which is kind of an explosive injury, it's the ring of C2 um, that results from an axial looting uh, on the head and usually some kind of motion forwards or, or back that explodes the ring of, of C2. And depending on the type of that, they're very often not uh, neurologic uh, injury because it's a, an expansion of the canal. They're just unstable because the head's sort of flopping on its own column versus the rest of the posterior uh, spinal um, canal uh, that becomes disconnected with it. Um, this is an example of the, the first. It's mostly a ligamentous injury. Um, and more and more of these patients, they used to die in the field, but more and more of these patients are coming to our trauma center and man, the EMS does an amazing job. They do an amazing job uh, in our trauma resuscitation uh, unit where the patients first presented shock trauma. And you can just even see the record prior to um, uh, going to see the patient that they have multiple arrests because they are, uh, have a very high medullary, um, almost brainstem type of injury. Um, and they're completely plegic. They've affected their respiratory and cardio uh, acceler accelerator centers. These are tough patients, um, but we're seeing more and more of them um, make it to the, to the hospital. Uh, C1 Jefferson fracture, as I mentioned, is a fracture, usually again, to axial loading to explode the ring of, of C1. Um, the odontoid fracture here is a, is a pretty brutal uh, C2 uh, dense, type two dense fracture. Um, it's actually pretty well aligned now. And you could treat this either through an entontoid screw or posteriorly by uh, posterior fusion. Um, and, and a hangman's fracture, this is a pretty bad one. Um, and a bad uh, dens fracture um, that's dislocated uh, posteriorly. Um, and so we can kind of see um, that some of these folks can have various degrees of stability. And this one's clearly a very unstable situation uh, with compression of the, the cord. In the hangman's fracture, um, we can kind of see the, the small um, lucency that's through um, the, the ring of C2. And so there's various types of trauma, the distraction flexion, um, distraction extension, extension, extension compression. Um, so we do see all of these and their management uh, can be quite different. There's a burst fracture, which is an axial loading type fracture, a fracture dislocation, which potentially is the worst where you've got these three columns of injury and you have to put all of this back together. Um, there is uh, disrupted facets. There is a perched facet that we can see in the middle, 
Um, it's just about to go over in a lock facet. And these can be tough to reduce. We, we try to reduce them uh, often closed. That is put the head and gardener wells tongs with various weight and tilt the head forward and pull that back up. It's very disconcerting. You feel this ka-chunk. Um, and you usually under ideal situations, try to do it when the patient's awake and can tell you, hey, uh, I'm getting numb or something doesn't feel right. Um, and, but sometimes that doesn't lock and, or it doesn't work and you have to, to go to the OR for that, um, at least to reduce it and then uh, OR to diffuse it. Here's a tear, teardrop fracture, again, another axial loading and, and flexion uh, kind of injury. Lots of spinous process fractures, so-called clay shovel or uh, injury. We get multiple of these with a hyper uh, extension type of injury. Ligamentous injuries that may not show up on CT, um, but certainly MRI. Uh, we can see that the posterior spinous, uh, interspinous uh, ligaments are disrupted here. And for thoracolumbar trauma, um, very similar classification scheme, type A, B, and C, um, and various subgroups, uh, whether they're compression injuries, distraction injuries, or translation injuries are, are the worst. Um, and sometimes they're literally side by side. Um, and you have to figure out a way to pull those back in alignment and, and fix those. Um, of note, thoracic injuries tend to be really bad. Um, the, just by way of passing, the, the thoracic cord has a hodgepodge of radicular arteries that supply it. So its blood supply is not always consistent and there's very little watershed or areas of overlap in the thoracic cord. The cervical cord has redundant uh, arterial blood supply. Um, and so that's one bad thing. And the other thing with thoracic is protected by a rib cage, right? And so it takes a lot of energy to break a thoracic spine. And so usually those patients have other injuries or they're in a very high energy fall from, you know, greater than 20 feet or a high velocity MVC uh, type of situation unless they have some underlying uh, bone issues. And as far as non-surgical treatments, um, this is kind of a classic um, uh, hard collar, a cervical uh, orthosis. Um, that can, that can be used, um, a CTO, a cervical thoracic orthosis, a um, little more stable at the, at the base. The, the classic cervical ones can certainly snake, right? They're, they're not fixed and rigid. So patients can still move around in there. Um, and, and these are okay for mid cervical, upper cervical, lower cervical, not so great. Um, and this still has the same issue with upper cervical, but better for mid cervical and then lower cervical at the cervical thoracic junction, because as you can imagine, wearing that sort of vest deal um, immobilizes even better. And then the best stability is the halo, but these things are tough and tricky. Um, they're great for high cervical C1, C2 uh, kinds of fractures, but the rest of the spine kind of snakes. Um, and if you have patients that have polytrauma, that have chest trauma, lung contusions, uh, these can sometimes be problematic, but sometimes it's the only thing you have. Um, for young people, a little bit of a torture device, but it can preserve motion. Um, and so if you've got an amenable fracture, um, like a, a, a dense fracture that's well aligned and has a good chance of fusing in a relatively young person, this obviously isn't, isn't great for your social life, but uh, at the same time, um, it allows you to potentially move your neck later on. Um, and of course you have to um, bring them back in and, and assess uh, how they're fusing as, as time goes. For older folks, and by older, I mean 55, 60, um, it can quite literally be a coffin. Um, data has shown that folks don't do very well uh, older folks don't do very well in these. Um, they tend to languish, uh, and also they tend not to fuse very well. Uh, so there is an upper age limit on, on halo. Um, there, there are places who don't use them at all, um, but we, we use a fair number at, at trauma uh, because we do have a fair number of, of younger uh, types of patients as well as the older patients. And so Surgical management, are you going to do closed cervical traction, anterior, posterior, both? Um, all these questions. And this is just a patient um, face protected that was 
in cervical traction. This is in um, the trauma resuscitation area. You can kind of see the general uh, setup um, where there's this um, uh, weights and traction applied to the, to the head. The patient's feet are actually to our right and the head is behind the black box there. Um, and with the C-arm looking at the, the fracture dislocation as you add more weight and then weight um, and sometimes you have to gently kind of flex the head and twist to one side if it's a unilateral versus a bilateral uh, fracture dislocation. And if they do reduce by CRM fluography, great. Um, you can reduce the weights to basically just a maintenance weight and then off to the OR uh, to, to fuse. And so um, with closed, although um, this doesn't reproduce very well, but on the left, um, we can see um, that there's a, a, a dislocation um, that's been uh, reduced. We can kind of see the joint jumped up over and on the right that that's uh, been, whoop, there we go, successfully reduced. Um, and so for anterior cervical uh, surgery, generally um, two kinds of flavors, uh, anterior cervical discectomy infusion or corpectomy, uh, if the vertebral body itself is severely fractured or into the canal itself. Posterior cervical surgery, laminectomy infusion, um, occipital and C1, C2 fixation are their own little uh, subspecialties and thoracic uh, fixation as well. So you have a 40 year old patient who's been in a car uh, crash, the minimal movement of the arms and legs at the scene. And so of course, it's always the ABCs, uh, really an ABCD. Um, and sometimes we like to say ABC, meaning CAT scan um, at, <laughs> at shock trauma, uh, if they're stable enough to, to go for a CT, but always airway and breathing. Um, no matter what else, what's going on, if your patient's not breathing, um, then you've got a problem. Um, and then followed quickly by circulation, of course. And so is there a suspicion of spinal cord injury or, or fracture? Certainly if it's a high mechanism uh, injury, a car crash with uh, prolonged extrication, uh, rollover, unseat belted, uh, death at the scene, um, all of these raise your, your antenna for there may be something going on. Of course, um, the ABCD, the disability, uh, usually follows. Then you can try to suss out, are they moving all of their extremities? Are they lifting them off the ground? Um, are they not? Um, the pain and neurologic exam, um, of course, quick C-spine immobilization until you can figure out what's going on um, and try to keep the map elevated. This gets a little tricky in someone who's got an outright hemorrhage and say that they've, they've lost a limb um, and the tourniquet's been applied and you've stopped the bleeding, okay. Sometimes that's not the case. Um, and there's so-called permissive hypotension, um, uh, a systolic less than 90. Uh, and, and so it gets a little tricky if you've got someone with a polytrauma um, in the management of these, but ideally you'd like to keep the map elevated. Uh, steroids are not commonly used uh, anymore. They used to be a very high dose steroid course um, for several days, um, but, but we no longer use that commonly. Um, imaging, CT and MRI are always our friends, the donut of truth. Um, and just a quick definition of, of spinal shock and neurogenic shock. You'll, you'll hear these, these terms. Neurogenic shock is really more of a clinical um, diagnosis and instead of being at some loss of the sympathetic nervous system um, signals. So they're vasoplegic, they're very hypotensive, um, they're bradycardic um, because the signals aren't going to the brainstem um, cardiac accelerator center. Um, their motor exam could be variable um, and it's due to disruption of the autonomic pathways, the loss of the sympathetic tone and the vasodilation of blood is just pooling in the periphery. For spinal shock, it's immediate temporary loss of total power sensation and reflexes below the injury. Um, and, and so um, the bulbar cavernous reflex, et cetera, you can test reflexes to see is it neurogenic shock or, or spinal shock. Um, and so uh, they'll present with flaccid paralysis, um, and this tends to be a temporary uh, thing. Uh, peripheral neurons become temporarily unresponsive to brain stimuli and then improve. The neurogenic shock may not. 
um, and they may need pressors or other things to actually clamp down on the peripheral vasculature um, to, to bring up their blood pressure. This is the, the Asia, um, uh, the American Spinal um, uh, Institute of American Association uh, motor exam and sensory exam. This is the kind of exam that's carried out in, in all of the, the spinal injury patients. Uh, we can see all the, the dermatomes and muscle groups outlined um, in the total scores uh, that you would expect uh, from that. And based on that, um, the um, the um, there is a uh, Frankel um, class of Asia impairment scale that, that's given A, B, C, and D. And sometimes this can be very confusing. And it's probably easier just to deal with the, the beginning and the end. A is complete. That is, there is nothing preserved below a certain spinal cord injury. There is no sensation uh, preserved. There's no motor that's preserved, even including um, the sacral segments, the, the, the rectal uh, exam for sensory and motor. E is completely normal, full strength, full sensation everywhere. And then in between, it gets a little confusing. For B, an incomplete has sensory, but no motor function pre preserved below the neurologic level. This is kind of classic if, if someone has a high um, or mid cervical injury, and they might have like a bicep that works or something, um, but nothing below that. And if they have no perirectal sensation, um, then that is the, the sacral elements, uh, S4 and S5, uh, then that's complete. If they do have sensation, it's incomplete. So sensory is, is preserved. And C is incomplete. That's motor function preserved below the neurologic level with greater than half the muscles having a muscle grade less than three. So still a pretty poor exam. And D can actually be, be quite good. Uh, it's a motor function preserved uh, below the neurologic level greater than half the muscles have a muscle grade greater than, than three. And this can even include something like, oh gosh, you're like a four out of five in your right wrist. And that, that's it, like a 99D. Um, on, on your exam or something like that. And so the initial evaluation and the overall recovery, not much has really changed over the years. Um, folks who present, uh, and this is post-resuscitation um, recovery um, uh, and, and assessment, that if they're an A and complete on assessment, um, really, 10% or less actually eventually recover the ability to ambulate in some, some way, shape or form. And often this is with braces, kind of um, like those very stiff metal braces on your legs and things like that. And the, the B incompletes 33%. So that's a huge difference. And, and it's, um, it seems like a minor thing. Um, and, and quite honestly, the, the sensation, the perirectal sensation, the difference between that and an A, that's, that's really it. Um, there's a threefold increase uh, in the possibility of being able to, to ambulate over time. And this is assuming the best of care. Um, and C's, the incompletes, um, and about 75% D's, um, given that they're relatively minor, uh, overall they generally do quite well. Um, and so, uh, just some, some classic landmarks that you guys I'm sure have heard about. T4 uh, sensory levels about at the nipple, the T10 um, is at the umbilicus, just as quick landmarks in, in the assessment. And so um, you have a 40 year old patient, a car accident, minimal movement of arms and legs at the scene. You assess him as a 45C. This is an incomplete uh, injury. And this is what it looks like. So pretty gnarly, right? So there's a couple of things going on. Um, it's, it's broken in a couple of places, right? So a, a non-expert can see that there are some things with this, this CT that, that aren't right. Um, you have fractures at, at different levels. Um, you have potential dislocation um, in, in the mid-cervical spine as well. Um, gosh, how, how do you approach a, a patient like that? Um, that's just showing some, showing some axial uh, pictures through there to show uh, the degree of fractures that, that, are, that are happening here. And this is an MRI um, showing that fracture at C2 um, and then lower down in the mid-cervical region. 
And um, surprisingly, the cord has some injuries. Um, and it's always important to remember that, you know, a lot of these scans, that's kind of a resting point uh, where the folks are getting a CT or MRI and things have already happened. They've already uh, hyperextended or hyperflexed um, and really dinged their spinal cord. Um, and then they come back through elastic recoil to a resting position. Um, and so this may not be as bad as it's ever been. So obviously you have to be very careful, careful with these folks and uh, see spine immobilization. Um, and so uh, the, the spine I think is very fascinating. It's one of the things that, that uh, is a majority of my, my practice because uh, you know my, my prior training in undergraduate was physics and, and that kind of thing. And so the spine makes sense to me. It's biomechanically a, a really cool thing. Um, in addition to, to carrying the, the neural elements. And so obviously it supports the head, the upper extremity and torso, it supports the body mass, um, transmits the weight to the hips, it maintains an upright posture. I think it's just really cool how the body tries to maintain the, the, the head over the shoulders, over the pelvis, with this neat um, uh, sort of alternating lordotic, kyphotic, lordotic uh, spinal arrangement. It allows for mobility and flex, flexibility, all while protecting the spinal cord. So to me, the spine is, is a neat thing. Um, and so uh, generally in, in the trauma patients, is there a neurologic injury? Is the spine stable? I, that is from a surgical standpoint, right? It's from a neurosurgical uh, viewpoint with carpenters. Um, if there's something to fix, we, we should have a reason to, to fix it. Um, and so do the neural elements need to be decompressed or is that injury already happened and it's not uh, compressed? Is it stable? Can I brace it externally? Um, does it need surgery, front, back or both? So these are all kind of quick questions. And for the patient that, that we showed about, there was neurologic injuries, 45C, um, and the neural elements need to be decompressed because we saw that, that crazy uh, MRI. Um, and is the spine stable? No, it's fractured, it's dislocated, dislocated uh, very unstable, can't brace it. Um, well, I guess you could, but it's not really the standard of care. Um, and, and so, gosh, what, what do you do? Um, this particular uh, patient needed both front and back uh, surgery. Um, this was actually a surgery that, that Dr. Crandall did. Um, first, they did a C2 to T2 laminectomy infusion. It's just kind of showing the, the alignment of, of the screws on the, the intraoperative flography, um, both AP and, and uh, laterally. And so this is showing the first stage really is to decompress that spinal cord, which we can see in the, the MRI on the right-hand side and at least provide stability. We can't see them here, but those screws are running all the way down from C2 to T2 out laterally. So there's stability now. Now it looks, it's not optically pleasing, right? Um, so we still see something's amiss. Um, and so uh, there's more work to do. Um, and so had an anterior surgery that shows um, just a post-op uh, X-ray with uh, the ACDF uh, plate that's in place. And then you can see the alignment is much better uh, through that. And that area can kind of heal with the, the bone graft uh, that, that's in there. Um, and so um, the, the patient actually ended up doing very well. This is case two with a 78 year old man slipped on ice. I've done that, dislocated and tore my bicep off uh, my right arm um, uh, some years ago and also broke my fibula. That was a mess. Uh, I had to wheel around uh, on a little scooter around the, the hospital. Um, fortunately, I was able to, since I do both critical care and, and surgery, I spent more time in, in doing critical care for a while as one of my orthopedic colleagues uh, fix that. So I can appreciate uh, this patient, I'm not quite 78 uh, yet, but um, Asia 76D. Um, and again, looking at our impairments uh, scale, an incomplete injury, uh, not too shabby, but this is what it looks like, right? So uh, this is a very straight neck. Um, he's got a, a lot of degenerative changes, um, a lot of osteophytic growth um, and an narrow canal. Um, basically just from all this wear and tear um, and the trend of changes on the cervical spine. So the CT, you suspect, hmm, something's not right. He dinged his neck, he had to, so, um, or his cord. And so 
uh, our friend the MRI, the, again, the donut of truth, uh, shows us that he does have cord injury, um, basically behind the body of C4, a little bit behind C3. And um, there's a, some degenerative changes there, um, some disc osteophyte uh, complexes, they're partially ossified, um, and some ligamentum flavum uh, buckling uh, into uh, the cord. And so no fracture, acute spinal cord injury. This is a classic central cord syndrome. And so I predict almost already that his hands would, would be weak. So is there neurologic injury? Yep. Do the neural elements need to be decompressed? Yep. Is the spine stable? Probably. Yeah, it's actually probably gosh darn stable. Um, can I brace it? Won't do anything. It's just locking it in, in place the way it is. Does it need surgery? Um, oh. And I happen to hit, yeah, um, and do it through the through the back, um, and so approaching this particular patient through the front, you might be able to, but that's a tough slog. And I'll tell you, getting a C two three discectomy, I've done them, is really hard because C two is kind of conical and fades away from you under uh, neath um, the the jawline there, uh, so that's a tough get. And plus they're partially ossified um, and it's very hard to get off all of that um, uh, posterior longitudinal ligament that might be ossified and actually stuck to the dura. So you're setting yourself up for either a cord injury because you have no room to work. The cords like smack up against where you need to get that bone from. Um, but also if it's stuck to the dura, a CSF leak and, and getting that through an anterior approach is, is tough. Sometimes they just don't go away and, and the patient's in for a tough slot. And so definitely a posterior is, is, is the way to go in this patient. Um, and so this just shows the interoperative screws in the placement. And so very nice decompression. You can kind of see it's kind of hard to get all the screws and things in, in line, um, but uh, you can kind of see the, the lateral mass uh, screws um, and uh, the, the rod fixation there for that patient and the MRI with a, a very nice decompression. And you can kind of see that almost targetoid lesion uh, in the spinal cord itself is, is a residual uh, lesion there. And so not all trauma is acute. 60-year-old um, female C2 fracture 30 years ago, treated with a laminectomy. <laughs> I'd like to read that medical record, not sure what the thinking was there, but. Uh, presents with pain and progressive uh, myelopathy. So this is what her um, CT looks like. And so you can kind of see um, it's a mix of some of the, the earlier cases um, where there's been uh, um, a C2 dissociation um, and, and the kind of a chronic uh, dens type fracture. And, and then lower down, we see some degenerative changes and, and uh, some spinal canal narrowing. And so this is what her, her MRI looked like. And so we have a couple of areas of, of issues. Um, and it depends on is she stable and what do we need to, to fix for this, this particular patient. And so um, we did a flexion extension to, to see if uh, she was, was stable. Um, and she actually was moving. Um, this was just a line um, on the back of C2. Um, and you can see from the difference between flexion and extension uh, that these lines change. So she's actually moving, banging on her spinal cord uh, higher up. So that, that's a problem. So every time that, and she did complain to that, like electric shock um, running down uh, her, her body. So is there not neurologic injury? Yep. Um, do the neural elements need to be decompressed? Yes. Um, is the spine stable? No. We saw that an inflection extension and x-ray gives you a tremendous amount of injury. Or injury, I hope not. <laughs> it gives you a little bit of injury, not as much as a CAT scan. But um, it gives you a tremendous amount of, of information, um, sometimes more than a CT or MRI can show because it's a, it's a dynamic study that actually shows um, the degree of motion that, that's happening there. Um, and can you brace it? Won't help in this case, it's a chronic injury. Um, and what do you do? Um, and so do the surgery uh, from the front and the back actually. Um, ACDF at that lower down uh, degenerative area and then uh, C2 
one to uh, complete the laminectomy infusion that's there. There's the anterior cervical discectomy infusion to get that lower down uh, area. And then this is just interop pictures uh, showing placement um, of the C1 um, uh, lower mass in the, the C2 screws as well in the parts. And so this um, uh, shows uh, the x-ray and the completed x-ray for, for that patient to stabilize and, and decompress her. And so the, the summary of uh, uh, all of this, uh, again, is upper motor neuron lesions involve uh, injury to the, to the CNS. Complete spinal cord injuries have no motor um, or sensory function below the level of injury. Um, and especially that, that is the S4, S5 elements, uh, perirectal sensation. And conic spinal syndrome is a medical emergency that, that often appears in sort of board type questions um, and is often listed as one of the, the five um, medical or neurosurgical uh, emergencies uh, that, that uh, are out there. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.